Hello, I'm Janet Cobb, Executive Director of USS Alabama Battleship Memorial Park. We opened our doors to the public in January of 1965. Since that time, the park has received over 17 million visitors. We are home to two National Historic Landmarks, the Battleship USS Alabama and Submarine USS Drum. We have over 30 aircraft on the grounds, as well as several military vehicles, including armor from World War II through Desert Storm. Our 155-acre park acts as a home for many native species of plants and animals, and we are proudly part of the Alabama Birding Trail. Now, I invite you to enjoy a short film about the history of the Mighty A and the men who took her to war. <laughs> birth of a titan. Battleship Alabama's keel was laid on February the 1st, 1940, to much fanfare at the Norfolk Naval Shipyard in Portsmouth, Virginia. Alabama was the last of the South Dakota class ships to be laid down, then launched from her berth roughly two years later on 16 February, 1942. I'm George R. Smith. I like to brag about my career with the USS Alabama. I was employed by the Norfolk Navy Yard early in 1942, and I happened to be one of the lucky fellows to be aboard when it was launched. Uh, my job consisted partly of tank testing. After the ship was waterborne, we had to test all the tanks below the waterline to make sure we had no leaks. During the operation of the launching of this ship, we had anchors on each side of the ship to keep it from drifting back too far in the Navy Yard. And during that operation there, we had hosers up there with the anchors there. And one of the men with a broad ax cut one of the anchors there and it made the ship swing around. Well, the anchors on this side made the ship swing to starboard. The tugs were doing all they could and barely kept the ship from swinging into the piers uh, in the Navy Yard. After the ship was launched and we tested the tanks there, we secured everything, and each one of the people in the launching crew there had armbands. Well, we were warned, the boys, the fellows aboard the ship, that the armbands were being taken at the gate. So the fellows aboard ship kept the armbands. One, the one I wore, I still have today. However, while Alabama was still under construction, a great tragedy took place. It was a quiet Sunday morning, 7 December, 1941, and the last day America would know peace for several years to come. Conflict had landed on America's doorstep. At 7.48 a.m. Hawaiian time, over 300 Imperial Japanese planes descended on the American Pacific Fleet. Their capital ships at anchor on Battleship Row. By 10 a.m., all eight of the American battleships present were damaged. Four of them lay on the bottom of the harbor. One of them, the USS Arizona, suffered a catastrophic magazine explosion. The mighty warship's back was broken, rendering her a total loss. Army airfields Hickam, Bellows, and Wheeler were devastated by the attack. United States Navy and Marine aircraft on Ford Island were also ravaged. The human cost was staggering. 2,335 American military personnel were lost, with a further 1,143 injured. Civilians did not escape unscathed. 68 were killed and 35 were wounded. The surprise attack was a resounding victory for the Japanese forces. The Japanese lost five midget submarines, 29 aircraft, and 64 airmen. America was now a country at war. The Pacific Fleet was left in ruin. The aging battleships would take time to refloat and refit. Eventually, seven of the eight would be raised, and six would return to operational status. In the interim, it was up to the young guns to take up arms. The day of the American fast battleship had arrived.
With construction nearly complete, she was commissioned on 16 August 1942. It took only 30 months to go from blueprints to a fully functional battleship. Alabama began her shakedown cruise on 11 November 1942, departing Chesapeake Bay and continuing to Casco Bay, Maine. A new United States man of war makes a trial run before joining the fleet. 41,000 tons of fighting ship, she's the fastest, most powerful battleship afloat. Google sounds general quarters, and 2,000 trained men go to battle stations to test the big guns. Powerful 16-inch rifles swing towards the target. Observers, hooded and dressed for below zero cold, are at their post. America's greatest, the mightiest dreadnought ever built, is going into action. She returned to Chesapeake Bay on 11 January 1943, concluding her shakedown. Following this, she went back to the Norfolk Navy Yard in February of 1943. Her Measure 12 modified camouflage scheme was changed to a two-tone Measure 22 scheme. There was a reason for this change. Measure 22 was meant for surface combat. Alabama, along with her sister battleship, the USS South Dakota, found themselves steaming to the North Atlantic to rendezvous with the British home fleet. Winston Churchill himself had asked President Roosevelt for help in the form of the U.S. Navy's 16-inch battleships to make up for the Royal Navy capital ships sent to the Mediterranean to support the invasion of Sicily. Convoys supplying the UK were still under threat of attack from German Kriegsmarine battleships like Tirpitz and Scharnhorst. Alabama and South Dakota were sent to join the hunt for both. In addition to their armor, the sister South Dakotas were bringing their nine 16-inch 45 caliber rifles. Alabama was outfitted with 20 5-inch 38 caliber dual-purpose guns at 10 twin mounts while South Dakota had 16 of the same guns in eight mounts. They were both outfitted with a bristling anti-aircraft battery comprised of 40 millimeter Bofors and 20 millimeter Orlicons. Armed to the teeth, the sister ships set out in early April. While there, the American ships took part in operations with the Royal Navy, including one that reinforced the island of Spitsbergen and an attempt to lure the mighty German battleship Tirpitz from her Norwegian hiding place called Operation Governor. It was during the latter that Alabama first fired her guns in anger. A Junkers Ju-88 was spotted by the task force and, according to Alabama's own logs, she fired a two-minute volley from her five-inch guns. The Ju-88 pilot thought better of getting closer and departed the area. When it became apparent that the German fleet was not going to be drawn out for a major surface engagement, Alabama was recalled for another overhaul at the Norfolk Naval Yard in preparation for a new duty assignment, the Pacific Theater. At this time, Alabama received some substantial upgrades, including a powerful Mark 8 fire control radar to assist in firing her main guns and the Mark IV radar for her secondary batteries. This gave Alabama a significant edge as it meant she could now engage an enemy without a clear line of sight and could fire her guns accurately at night or in bad weather. She also received additional 40 millimeter and 20 millimeter anti-aircraft guns. She was repainted in her new Measure 21 camouflage scheme and set out for the Pacific Theater. Once again, her new paint scheme reflected her new role. Measure 21 was designed to make a ship harder to see from the air and deemed to be more effective in the Pacific.
So it was a great experience going through the Panama Canal. I mean, uh, it's something when I was in high school, I'd give a five minute talk on, never dreaming that I would go through it any time. And so that would be one of the greatest experiences. It was so wide going through it that, as I remember, they only used about a three inch hawser line on both sides as bumpers to ease it into the, into the locks there. And it took most of the day to get through there. After passing through the Panama Canal, Alabama embarked on a lengthy training exercise to prepare the ship and crew for carrier escort duty. It didn't take long for Alabama to be thrown into action. She and her crew took part in Operation Galvanic, where she screened for carriers. 12 January 1944 found the massive battle wagon at Pearl Harbor, where she underwent a short dry docking for maintenance and to replace the port outside propeller. The ship and her crew wouldn't stand idle for long as they were back out again by the 21st. She was attached to the carrier Essex and task group 58-2, where she then took part in Operation Flintlock, the invasion of the Marshall Islands. She and her sister, South Dakota, along with battleship North Carolina, bombarded the island of Roy on the 29th and Namur on the 30th which resulted in massive damage to Japanese installations. On 12 February, Alabama joined the assault on truck. From here, the men of the Mighty A took her to the Marianas in order to help with the strike on Tinian, Saipan, and Guam. The Caroline Islands was the next stop for the battleship and her crew. Fast carriers struck positions at Palau, Ulithi, Wulei, and Yap, while the fast battleships provided cover for them. The crew earned a brief respite on Majuro. After a short stay, she once again went underway with Task Force 58 on 13 April. Over the course of the next three weeks, the task force conducted strikes and covered army landings throughout New Guinea, as well as conducted further strikes on truck, laying down the groundwork for the future invasion of the Marianas Islands. Alabama joined a firing line with five other fast battleships targeting a Japanese airfield on the island of Ponape. Captain Fred T. Kirtland of the battleship Alabama stated, the 70 minute bombardment was conducted in a leisurely manner. Alabama proved her mettle at the Battle of the Philippine Sea on 19 June. It was Alabama's surface to air radar that spotted the Japanese formation at roughly 190 miles and alerted the task force of their presence. At first, Alabama's warning was unheeded as it was believed her radar was unable to attain such long range. Alabama again warned of incoming bogeys. Bearing 268, true, distance 141 miles, angels 24 or greater, closing on her air search radar at 1006. USS Iowa confirmed, thus American aircraft were able to get into the air and in a position to defend the fleet. We had an Ensign Bates on. He was a third division officer. Ensign Bates, he was as good as watches the plotting room. And he was the one who was on duty when they found that, uh, picked up that Amado Japanese planes that were coming. So that made us, I think, 250 miles away. Battle of the Philippine Sea was a great success for the United States, dealing a devastating blow to Japanese forces. Their losses were three fleet carriers and between 550 and 645 aircraft. The battle began so lopsided, American pilots referred to it as the, quote, Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. Well, the most exciting thing was the day they called the Turkey Shoot when they shot down 300 and some airplanes over, and you were watching the dogfighting going on and the torpedo bombers coming in. I mean, there was action in the water and in the sky, and everybody was shooting, and uh, we didn't get hit, so I mean, it made a great day out of it. After the battle, Alabama was commended for their efforts by Vice Admiral W.A. Lee saying, quote, In the matter of reporting initial bogeys to Iowa, well done to Alabama, very well done. 14 July 1944. She was once again escorting carriers as they launched attacks to prepare for and support the landings on Guam on 21 July. Stopping briefly at Eniwetok, Alabama made steam and fell in formation with Enterprise during Operation Stalemate II. After this, the mighty warship steamed for the Philippines. 
The battleship provided cover for the carriers while striking several targets in the area, including Cebu and Leyte, between 12 and 14 September. Strikes focused on Japanese shipping and strongholds around Manila Bay between the 22nd and 24th. Task Force 38 was Alabama's next assignment on October the 6th, where she supported action in the Philippines and acted as an escort for the carriers while they attacked Okinawa and Formosa. While steaming for Luzon on 14 October, three Japanese planes fell to the gunners of Alabama with their fourth damaged. The next day she was protecting the landing at Leyte and then screened for carriers on the 21st. Alabama was attached to Enterprise. The job of the task force was to engage and destroy the Japanese Central Force headed for San Bernardino Strait. After Admiral Bull Halsey, in command of the task force, was in forward of a third group of Japanese ships, Halsey chose to take his ships and try to engage them. On 24 October, American forces managed to sink four Japanese carriers at the battle off Cape Engano but Admiral Takeo Kurita seized the opportunity and took the Central Force through the San Bernardino Strait with the goal of attacking the American landings. Only a small task group of escort carriers, destroyers, and destroyer escorts stood in their way. The task force called Taffy 3 fought the Japanese so fiercely that they were certain they were facing a larger force and retreated. Halsey reversed Task Force 34 and sent them to try to intervene, though it was far too late. Even though Taffy 3 had turned the Japanese Central Force, it had been mauled by the Japanese ships. Many lives were lost. The battle ended catastrophically for the Japanese Navy, however, as they lost 26 ships, including four aircraft carrier and three battleships. One of the battle wagons lost was the mighty super battleship Musashi, flagship of the Japanese Combined Fleet. The Battle of Leyte Gulf was the largest naval battle in history, and the Imperial Japanese Navy suffered its greatest ever loss of ships and crew. Japan's Navy never recovered. Alabama spent much of the month of November, from the 3rd to the 24th, screening for the fast carriers once again, as well as conducting operations against Visayas and Luzon. During the first part of December, maintenance and training occupied most of the crew's time, by the 14th, she was again screening the carriers, but conditions were about to change. On the 17th, during refueling, the weather began to deteriorate and the seas became rough. By the next morning, conditions no longer allowed for refueling, a situation that would prove fatal for some ships. High winds and heavy seas had even the Alabama, an extremely stable ship, rolling up to 30 degrees. Her float planes were badly damaged and the Alabama's aerological office recorded the strongest gust at 83 knots. Due to the light fuel loads, three destroyers did not have the ballast and fuel needed to weather the storm and were lost. The destroyers lost were the Monaghan, Hull and Spence. Yep, the Admiral made a mistake. He thought it would be better to ride through the storm. Well, that was a mistake. Because them waves, I mean, when them waves were as high as the bridge, I don't, I don't know what them guys on the motherships did because I worked pretty, worked pretty big. We did lose four destroyers that I recall. Those destroyers were they, they were being refueled, and the storm, the storm got so bad that we had to give up fueling the ships, even though the people that we were fueling knew it was going to be a disaster. They needed that fuel in there for ballast. You never read too much about that. Still. Finally, the task force made it through the storm on 19 December. The storm is known as Typhoon Cobra, and it claimed the lives of 790 American servicemen. Mercifully, 93 men were pulled from the water, alive, over the course of three days. In January 1945, Alabama was ordered to Puget Sound Naval Shipyard for her final refit. She was placed in dry dock on the 18th, once again painted in Measure 22 camouflage. This time, her concerns weren't the Japanese ships and aircraft. It was the Japanese shore batteries, as she would be pushing ever closer to the home islands for bombardment. Nevertheless, more room was dedicated to anti-aircraft guns and radar. The navigation bridge was enclosed at this time to offer the captain and crew more protection from the elements. 
Modifications were made throughout the ship to make more room for the increased number of sailors it took to maintain and fire the additional anti-aircraft guns. Work continued all the way until Alabama got underway for standardization trials and refresher training on March 17th. While screening on 14 May, several Japanese planes made for the carriers. Alabama's guns claimed two more planes and helped destroy another two. Alabama once again found herself at odds with Mother Nature. On June 5th and 6th, the task force was enveloped in Typhoon Connie, also known as Typhoon Viper. The storm caused little damage to Alabama, but some ships like the heavy cruiser USS Pittsburgh were heavily damaged. On July 16, 1945, as Alabama was streaming in company with a fueling group off Honshu, Japan, Rear Admiral Richard E. Byrd was transferred at sea via breaches buoy from the destroyer USS Abbott to the USS Alabama. Rear Admiral Byrd served aboard the Alabama for 23 days as an observer for shore bombardment, mainly against the Japanese mainland islands of Honshu and Hokkaido. Alabama fired her last shots of the war near Honshu, Japan, where she bombarded war material manufacturing plants just 50 miles north of the Japanese capital of Tokyo. Shortly thereafter, two atomic bombs were dropped on Japan, bringing a speedy end to the war. On August 15, 1945, Japan's Emperor Hirohito announced that Japan had capitulated. Thus, Alabama's main battery was silenced, never to fire again. Her war service was over. Placing troops on Japanese soil, however, was another matter. Prior to actually signing the surrender treaty, no one knew for sure how the Japanese people would react to armed Americans occupying their homeland. On August the 30th, 1945, Alabama's Marine Detachment joined a landing force that seized Yokosuka Naval Base. Alabama's Marines were some of the first foreign boots on Japanese soil in nearly 700 years. Fortunately, the landing went without incident and Japan signed the instrument of surrender on board USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay on September 2, 1945. On the 5th of September, after the signing, Alabama led the remaining American fleet into Tokyo Bay. While there, the Alabama sent a boarding party to the Japanese battleship Nagato, the only Japanese battleship to survive the conflict. Battleship sailors and marines went ashore and met the Japanese people. There was fear and distrust from all parties at first. Relations quickly thawed, and the men of the Alabama remember the Japanese as kind, polite, and accommodating. Alabama ended the war with an exemplary record. She had accrued nine battle stars, conducted 10 bombardments, shot down a confirmed 22 enemy aircraft, and took part in the Battle of the Atlantic. All this was accomplished in the span of 51 months, or three years and five months. Steaming for home, Battleship Alabama brought back not only her crew, but an additional 700 CBs for Operation Magic Carpet. During this time in the ship's history, the galley had to run 24 hours a day to feed all of the men. The Seabees on board had to get creative with their sleeping arrangements, even sleeping on deck. BB-60 arrived in San Francisco on 15 October 1945 with the rest of the Third Fleet. They arrived just in time for Navy Day and held an open house aboard ship, allowing some 9,000 Americans to see their battleship Alabama. She spent the remainder of her short active career on the West Coast, but she was ultimately decommissioned at Puget Sound Navy Yard in Bremerton, Washington on the 9th of January, 1947. She spent the next 18 years waiting for her next mission. That mission came with the dawn of the 1960s. The Navy announced their plans to scrap several of America's now aging battleships. For nearly two decades, they waited for a war that mercifully never came. But the end had come for the North Carolinas and South Dakotas. In May 1962, the federal government announced that they would be scrapped, Alabama included. They were deemed too costly to refit for the modern fleet. Three ships from the two classes fell to the breaker's torch. The USS Washington, USS South Dakota, and USS Indiana were lost to history. 
Only portions of these ships were saved for posterity. But a forward-looking group of Mobilians and other Alabamians saw a bright future in the aging warship. They envisioned the Alabama as the anchor attraction for a Veterans Memorial Park to be located in Mobile. Fundraising began. The children of Alabama raised an astonishing $100,000 of the total $1 million needed to relocate the ship from Bremerton, Washington to Mobile, Alabama. The ship was towed by tugboats the entire way. The longest mile per ton tow in history at the time. She opened to the public as a memorial and museum on 9th January 1965. She is joined by fleet submarine USS Drum and a variety of aircraft and vehicles. She stands a silent sentinel of liberty in Mobile Bay, an everlasting monument to the men and women of Alabama as well as her crew to the sacrifices made for liberty. <laughs> Uh-huh.